Rodney Nigel Mayfield. Straight butter dating and relationship talk. Now that's straight butter. Welcome to Straight Butter Dating and Relationship Talk. I'm Rodney Nigel Mayfield. We got a hot show for you today. Today's show topic is Abused, Homeless, and Suicidal to Redeemed in Christ Jesus. The Sharon Fields Transformation Story. A must watch. Let's do it. Back to the show. Before I get started, I'd like to ask everyone who watches this video to subscribe to this channel if you've not already done so, and click the notification bell and the drop down menu that says all so that every time I upload new video content, you'll be notified. Also, like, share, and please leave a comment. Again, today's show topic is Abused, Homeless, and Suicidal to Redeemed in Christ Jesus, the Sharon Fields Transformation Story. All right, she went from rock bottom to finding redemption and purpose in Christ. And she's here today to share her powerful testimony with you. So, introduce yourself to my audience. Good afternoon, my name is Sharon Fields. I'm a 55 year young, uh, mother of three, grandmother of five. I live here in Memphis. Uh, Trent moved all the way from Milwaukee, Wisconsin to Memphis, Tennessee. I'm currently um, enjoying this beautiful life. As as you can, as you'll understand that I came from a very low place in life to where Jesus Himself became a part of my life and pulled me out of some tragic things that we'll talk about later. I'm an author, publisher, minister of the gospel, and I also work with children and youth. And I've done that for the past 20 years. All right, all right. It's a pleasure to have you on the Straight Butter Dating and Relationship Talk Show, Sharon. Thank you for coming. Now, let's give Sharon Fields, Arthur Sharon Fields, a round of applause and thank her for coming on the Straight Butter Dating and Relationship Talk Show. Now, Sharon, before I start this interview, I want to ask you this question. Is everything that you're going to talk about 100% true? So help you God. Yes, please. All right. Well, that's all I wanted to hear. Let's chop it up. Sharon, share your testimony with my audience about you being abused, homeless, and suicidal to redeem in Christ Jesus. Well, I'll start. Now, and also speak up so that the microphone can catch your voice. Yes, okay. It all started when I was about five years old. My mom moved me and my brother to Wisconsin um, after she separated from my father. We moved in with an uncle who lived with us, and from the time I was five, years old to nine year old, the nights of him coming into my bedroom, getting me out of the bed, different things, and he would masturbate, pleasing himself. And I don't remember him penetrating me with his uh, his penis or anything of that nature, but I do remember him fondling me, fingering me, and uh, ejaculating on my body. Wow. So I do remember those things. Wow, that's that's uh, traumatic in itself uh, to a little child or even a teenager is traumatic. So I'll continue with your story. Uh, those years, it, it lasted about four years. Uh, we moved back to Tennessee where my mother, uh, mother was ill and we lived in a par- place called Brayton, Tennessee. You probably never even heard of it. It's a little small place in Fayette County. Brayton or Brighton? Brayton. B-R-A-D-E-N. Brayton, Tennessee, okay. outside of Mason. Okay. We lived there for a while. Things simmered down um, until my parents got back together and we moved to Fayette County. Um, another child was born. Fast forward a little bit to my years in school for me was so uh, traumatic because I, first of all, I was bullied. I had an accent. <laughs> and also I was so, I didn't trust. Um, I was very shaky. I didn't want you to even touch me from the, all the, you know, the years of, of my uncle touching me. I was very angry. All I was angry all the time. Very insecure, low self-esteem. That just went on throughout my 
years of school. Even though I was um, I was very smart, an honor student, I was popular, I was a cheerleader, um, I ran track in my ninth grade year. So you would think that doing all those things successful, I was a part of the student government, um, journalism staff, and secretary of FDA. So I was, I was popular, but I still had all these aches and pains and I was very traumatic. Forward to the, a lot of the rejection. Before you continue, yeah. now, uh, most people when they experience traumatic uh, situations like that, they're not doing well in school academically. But you said you uh, did very well academically in school. Now, was that a part of your early coping mechanism that you used uh, to keep people from knowing that you were going through? Did anybody at school question you about uh, what was going on at your house? No. Uh, when I moved here, that wasn't happening anymore. It stopped when I was nine years old. Okay. So we were back in here away from that uncle. But it was a coping mechanism for me it was performance okay um because my father left i believe that if he would have been there to protect me the event that's where the abandonment part came in it for me and i believe if i performed well enough for my dad he would never leave again okay. so that was a perform the performance part of me was that that trying to cope and trying to make my daddy love me make sure he never leaves me again make sure he protects me that's what that was okay. and i overperformed out through a lot of my life even my younger years in ministry, which we haven't gotten that yet, but performance and people pleasing and all that became a coping mechanism for me. Okay. Now, did your mother know anything about your uncle uh, molesting you? Uh, or was she trying to put that on the back burner and ignore it? Did she know her uncle, uh, her brother, right? Yeah, it was her brother. Did she know her brother was uh, a child molester? She did not know. My, um, I never told her. I was too afraid to tell her. I didn't believe she would actually believe me. Mm. And I, my uncle kind of, th he threatened me one time. I kind of, he threatened me one time. So I was like, you know, he was like, she was not going to believe you anyway. So as a little child versus a grown man, who are they going to believe? So I kept that hidden because I didn't think no one would believe. Is your mother still living now? No, my mother passed away. It'll be 12 years, uh, June 26th. Okay, sorry to hear about that. My condolences are to you and your family. Now, did your mother ever find out that you were molested by her brother, your uncle, uh, before she passed? I told her later years in life, and actually, she didn't believe me. I was about 17, 18 years old. Wow. So, was your mother the type of mother that wouldn't believe you regardless of what you said about her brother? I don't think so. She doesn't believe that. that was, was your mother a God-fearing mother? Yes, yeah, she was. She was a God-fearing mother, but she did not and would not believe her child if her child said, Mother, your brother raped me, Uncle raped She didn't believe me when I was 17. I don't think she would have believed me when I was five. I didn't tell her. I was too afraid, too ashamed to tell her myself. So. so at some point in your life, the older you got, your mother, did you ever bring that to your mother any other time outside of 17? No. I so your mother passed away not knowing or maybe knowing but not wanting to admit it. Do you think? I don't, I don't think she, again, I don't think she believed me. Okay. And because it was like, there was no physical, no evidence in her eyes. She was, not, you know, she was actually at work at nighttime. She used to work at this little nursing home, third shift. So she was not there. Okay. Was me and my little brother with my uncle, like he was the babysitter in Okay, so so where's your uncle now? Is he still living? He, he passed away uh, when I had my first child, 31 years ago. Okay, so this title is uh, homeless, uh, suicidal, uh, abused. Okay, we're talking about uh, the abuse. Now, uh, when children are abused uh, and they grow up, most of them become dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some who uh, make it through somehow by the grace of God or some are more strong than others mentally uh, but I think they still are affected some uh, shape form or fashion now where did the homelessness come from and what age were you when you became homeless and why did you become homeless did, did your mother put you out were you acting up in, in the home your mom said you're too grown and too fast and you got to get out of the house what was it was none of that. This is what happened. I'm glad you got to that part. Um, I graduated high school May 29th, 1988. I was an honor student, um, 
top 10 out of 400 and some students, 3.7 GPA. I'll never forget it. Wow. My parents split up again. So my mother was lit, had to go live with her father with my seven year old sister. Mm -hmm. They didn't have enough room for me. My brother wow. lived at home with my dad. My, my, my grandfather was living in a little small, one of those apartments where you have to monitor who's in and out of your house. My, my brother was 15 or 16, so he stayed at home with my dad, which my dad was partly there. My dad still was. But I was just out there. So it was like, we really don't have anywhere to go. Uh, they're sleeping in cars, sleeping with different types of people. That's where all the from the school we came in. So that was a lot of the effects of what happened to me. Because a lot of times when you're abused, you become the abuser or, or you continue to allow people to abuse you. I had really bad relationships with older males. Okay. And I ended up pregnant at 17 years old. This time I'm having sex, I became pregnant. Okay. So that's how I ended up homeless because of the breakup with my, par my parents on this a second time around. And there was just no room for me anyway. Wow, that's. Do you consider yourself as being the black sheep of the family? No. No. So, were any of your other siblings? How many siblings did you have? I have one sister and one brother. They're both younger. And so there was not enough room for you. You could have found a floor somewhere in the house to sleep. You now, think? My right? mother, a couple of times, let me slip in and sleep on the floor till my granddad got up. You have to understand those, those little project places out there where you had to. If you had somebody living with you, they would evict you. There's some there's some places that they have, right? If you don't have, they're not on your lease and all these different things. You have to be careful about this. So she would sometimes let me slide in when I did come in. But I was, again, after all this happened to me, I did become, I started drinking really heavily, um, going out, clubbing, doing all kinds of stuff. And she would let me slide in there if I wasn't already somewhere and sleeping. And so she did what she could do for me. It wasn't her place. Okay, so when your mother put you out, uh, or your father, now who put you out? Well, they remember put me out and just wasn't anywhere for me to go. Well, no room. well, if there's if there's no room for you, they're putting you out. In essence, we don't have enough room for you, so find you somewhere to go. And we know uh, we have enough experience in life to know that there's always some. Uh, dusty, shady man out there looking for a woman who really? has been a woman or a girl who's been put out the house who may have some type of dysfunction uh, to take advantage of. And usually it's old, older men because older men like dating younger girls. And they see younger girls who don't have uh, a stable background in the home uh, with their mother and father and who are looking for a sugar daddy or looking for somebody who's going to help to take care of them, give them a place to stay. And you were in that situation where you ran across a guy mm -hmm. or two or three or four and they were willing to bring you in uh, in exchange for the loving, right? Okay. It's, it's so many words, okay? Now, how do I know that? Because I have experience in life. Experience in life, no, I have not invited a woman in my house to take care of her because she fell on hard times. I know life. I've been around people. And so those things, wisdom teaches you. And that's why I was able to uh, give that part of the story. And I wasn't even involved in your story because that's how it happens. And you got women out there now who are doing the same thing. Who are looking for men, older. They go for older men because they figure older men are more established than these young bucks. These young bucks don't, don't want to work. Okay. Now let's get back to the, the homeless part. Now. You uh, were impregnated by an older man. Now, how much older was he than you? And you were 17 at the time? He was 23. 23. Okay, well, that's not, that's not, that's not, that's not bad. That's not bad. But you had graduated from school. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. Now, when did the suicidal uh, ideations uh, come into play? Now, how many children do you have now? I have three sons. Three sons. Okay. Now, did the suicide ideation and suicidal ideations come about when you just felt like you were at your wits end? You had three kids. Give me that story, Don. Okay. Uh, the suicidal ideations came when, uh, say, my son was almost two. So my youngest was two, so 24 years ago. My youngest son was a two year old in Pampers. I would never forget it. I was so, I was just so depressed and I was so tired. I was so tired of being used by men uh, for my body and what have you. And I was just, it was nothing like left. My family really wasn't there. We, had, we hadn't we had moved to Memphis at that time yet, but I was just at my wits end. And one day I was driving down I-40 
and I was behind. I was coming, approaching one of those 18 wheel trucks, and I had all three of my sons strapped in the seat belts and car seats. And I just heard this voice in my ear it says, "Just run into the back of the truck. It'll be all over. They won't miss you anyway." And I was like, "No, you know, I might as well try." So I, I pushed my foot to the pedal as hard as I could, but by the time I got to there, it's like the car just stopped. And it was like, okay, that must not be the answer because I can't even do it. Yeah. Uh, there were other times when I just wanted to end it, but I, I just never could do it. I was too scared to do it. There was something was of me saying, this is not the answer. But I was probably, I think I was 31 years old back then. And that's what's kind of like the turning point for me in my relationship. Because I, I grew up knowing about church, but I never had a foundation. Okay. Because way before all this suicidal parts, I I moved back to Wisconsin a little bit uh, when I was 19, got involved with uh, drug dealers. They started dating drug dealers. Uh, I've been shot at. It's a lot of stuff. I can't wow. talk about all that stuff today. But I've been shot at. I, I, dated, I was attracted to the bad boy okay. for a season in my life. Yeah. Uh, after being a church girl, I was attracted to a, a bad boy okay. and uh, heavily into all that kind of things. And the pregnancies I had. I, the first child that I actually was pregnant with, I had a miscarriage of 20 weeks when I was still 17. Um, and then I actually had two other pregnancies, which I actually talk about in the book, where I had I had an abortion before. So being pregnant six times <laughs> was something. And I and I tell people I have a really colorful past. So when they when they when I talk to people, it's not a judgmental part of me that talks. Okay. It's from the compassionate. I probably have experienced what you're talking about right now. Yeah. But I was just really depressed because I didn't, couldn't find love. Um, just looking for love and all. all and then places. I was embarrassed. I was pregnant six times by six different men, and I still had nobody to be there for my sons. And I was just an embarrassed wreck at that time in my life. Well, you know, uh, I'm not going to judge you uh, because I have my experiences. We all have our experiences, and. Uh, for me to point the finger at you, there's five more fingers pointing at me. You see what I'm saying? So all have seen and come short of the glory of God. And so that's why we're here today to talk about your story, because the last part of the title is redeemed in yes. Christ Jesus. Redeemed, yes, meaning you have been restored. You have been bought back yes. with the price. And that price is by the blood of Jesus Christ. OK, so now. This book right here. It says, look at me now. Uh, this is your book that you authored. Now, how long has this book been out? I published it in 2022. So two years. Okay. Two years at the, in October around my birthday. The book, Look at Me Now, uh, which means that uh, you have a lot of things in here. Now, I'm looking at one of these photos. <laughs> That's when you were, uh, is that you on the photo? Yeah, I was about, this was in 2016. I was about 440 pounds. Wow, 440 2016, pounds. 2016, this was 2022. I was about half that size. Okay. Well, uh, now what brought about the transformation of you uh, losing the weight? Well, I did do, use the procedure of the gastric sleeve, which is actually a, a tool to help you because if you don't stay consistent into the plan, it all comes it's back. Come back. So, um, and most people do get it back within three years and it's been six years for me. And All right. And, and so are you still, uh, pursuing, uh, losing more and tightening up more, uh, as we speak? Yes, I am. That's why I stay away from the bread products and all that stuff that you don't supposed to put in it. That, that, you know, at the All the stuff that I be cooking. <laughs> All the sugar. <laughs> All the stuff that I if be If you cooking. notice, I always ask you about your asparagus and your, your yeah. veggies and yeah. stuff. Because I be trying. Sometimes, you know. Yeah, yeah, I but the good thing is, I have not eaten cake, pies, cookies, and stuff in six years. Wow. That's that's <laughs> that, that's very hard to do because when, you're, when, you, you, when you're raised on the sugary uh, products, our parents give us cakes, candies, donuts, mm -hmm. stage plank, moon pies, and, and, and all of the whole gamut to, to keep us quiet. Hey, go ahead and get this, take this blow yep. pop and go on over in that corner. Go on, you know, do your thing. Is that all? Is that your point card? Yeah. Here he goes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so our bodies become addicted to that. Mm -hmm. And the same thing it's with becoming addicted to sex. Sex. You know, mm -hmm. uh, some things are hard to put away, but nevertheless, they can be put away. 
And so you just have to have the uh, capacity, the, the moral capacity or sex uh, to just stop, just move away from that. You know, it's easier said than done, but it can be done because God said. Can I, can I say something on that? Because you talked about something. Remember for where I went, six different pregnancies, six different men. So I was very sexual promiscuous. Yeah. But when I really got saved, when I really got saved for real, that was the easiest thing for me to stop doing. Wow. Well, like for I said, me, it was that, well, that, that's a great testimony because for most people, it's not. Now, Sharon, what made you want to share your testimony and your story with the world? There's so many people that go through this and they hide it. And it's nothing to be ashamed of because most of the time people walk in shame because of things that happen and they blame themselves. For a long time, I blamed myself for, and I had to re realize that I was five, six, seven, eight. How do I don't know what a five-year-old cost someone to do something to them that they can't control? So sometimes people grow up, and I've talked to a number of people that have these issues, and they really blame themselves. They walk around in shame because I walked around in shame, blame all of that for so much of my life that I couldn't even enjoy. It. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of sensitive things contained in the testimony that most people would not dare to talk about, let alone share with the world. Have you ever shared your testimony in church? And what was the reaction by the congregation? I've shared in different circles in my church. Uh, most of the, most everybody goes there, knows about the testimony because of the book. Uh, not many different, nothing like, wow, you know, nothing like that happened to you. Some people say stuff like that. But a lot of people are experiencing it. It's like, it's common. Yeah, it's almost a common thing. I've shared it at, um, I've done jail ministry for 15 years. I did jail east ministry. Okay. A lot of opportunities to share there with the women in jail east, in addition to the small groups that I do for the neighborhood Christians, sex and options. But I do Bible studies for that women, uh, in some of location. Okay. So, okay. so I do get an opportunity to share most of the time in small groups where we can actually dialogue and talk about it. A lot of times people start crying in and we can tell, okay, it's time for me. I sold my books that way, and then I pray for them and things of that nature. And okay. Go well, it. hey, Sharon, uh, what church do you attend, and who is your pastor? Uh, Pursuit of God Transformation Center, uh, Pastor Ricky Floyd. All right, Pastor Ricky Floyd. We are Facebook friends. Uh, pastor, you have a, a woman of God here who has uh, been redeemed in the Lord. Now, uh, did Pastor Floyd and his wife help you uh, come out of the situation that you were in? How much, if I could say how much, um, Pastor Ricky Floyd and Pastor Sheila Floyd, they have been a tremendous part in my deliverance from that. When I first got there, we were they were actually doing these small groups and they had a women's empowerment group. And that's where I learned to forget. Yeah. Because for before that, I hated my uncle. I hated him. And at 30 something years old, I had gout arthritis real bad and I had ganglions and all kinds of problems with my hand. I had surgery on both of them wrists and the surgeries didn't work. And it was all due to all that bitterness and unforgiveness that was trapped. They helped me to learn how to forgive. They used the Bible to teach me that. And one thing that, that, that God used my pastor for, Ricky Floyd for, was I didn't know how to love and I was afraid to even open myself up to somebody who loved me. Because every time I, I felt like, every time I loved somebody myself, they abandoned me. Okay. Um, so one day we were in a service and he was, he just grabbed me, he was just let us love. And I just fell on my knees and just broke down and cried. And this was probably, probably two years or three years after I had joined, which I joined 20 years ago, 20 years in July. Yeah. So it took that, it took him saying that we're not going to hurt you, we're going to love you for real. Yeah. And I just broke down and cried. And I remember even hearing a voice one day I was sleeping, the Lord said, I've always been here for you. Let me love you. Because I was always looking for love in people. Now understand that Jesus and God, they're waiting. He already loved me, but he was just waiting on me to accept the love that was already there for me. And he used those two people to change my life. Well, when people, uh, most people, if not all, I'll say all, we're raised thinking that love is sex. Love is infatuation, but that's not love. And when you get the definition of love wrong, then your perception of what love is, is going to be wrong. The word of God is the standard by which all truth is measured. 
And so God's definition of love is, is what true love is. But most people don't know that definition and they discard that definition when someone who is coming from a biblical perspective tell them this is how God uh, uh, desires you to look at the term love. They get upset and mad because they've been doing it wrong all of their lives. And so if somebody's been doing wrong for 40 years and they think that having a boyfriend and a girlfriend relationship, having sex outside of marriage is love, and you tell them, well, that's not what God uh, calls love. You know, you're living in fornication. They're going to get upset at you and they're going to think you're hating on them. Uh, and it's not so. You know, God's word, God tells us to do a particular thing because he knows it's going to be beneficial to us for the betterment for his glory and for our good. But when we do things contrary to God's word, then we are going to suffer the consequences, yeah. right or wrong. You're correct about the consequences. And some of those consequences can last for a lifetime. A lifetime. And they can also kill you. <laughs> On the other well, side of that, well, death. I'm spir talking about a spiritually, physical uh, death as well. Spiritually, uh, death, really as, as, as well as physical, physical death. Yeah. All right, Sharon. Do you volunteer with any 501c3 organizations uh, that help women, men, and children who have been abused or who are homeless or suffer suicidal ideations and who need to be redeemed in Christ Jesus? I currently do not, but I'm interested in doing that. And I actually have met someone that kind of introduced me to some things that I could do to get involved in some 501c3s that that do that. Well, you definitely have a powerful testimony. And like you said, uh, and it sounds cliche, but kids getting molested is the norm. It is really the norm. And so many of them hide it. Uh, and, and molestation happens in churches, Catholic churches, Baptist churches, Church of God in Christ churches. It doesn't matter the denomination. It happens. The thing is, when you have leaders who cover it up when they know because they don't want their church to be on blast, that's a problem. Because you have sin of omission and sin of commission. The sin that you know about, uh, but you say nothing, you're guilty. And sin uh, that you, you you didn't participate in, uh, but you still you know about it, but you say nothing because you don't want to uh, cause your church to have that black spot on it, black stain, so you don't say anything. So we have to, as Christians, be bold believers for Christ. And we have to call out sin when when uh, sin occurs, uh, whether it uh, causes the pastor to be set down for, for a while uh, to be restored. Uh, it doesn't matter. You know, we have to stand up for what's right. Now, uh, Sharon, we've already uh, went over the title of your book. Where can people go to purchase your book or contact you if they want to uh, buy your book? It is on Amazon. Uh, preferably, I would like for you to contact me directly. I have copies of them available in my car. Uh, you can reach me on social media, Facebook. This is Sharon uh, Fields, Loving the New Me. Also, you can, in, you can inbox me or just hit me up on my, my Facebook page itself. Or you can uh, you can email me at creativeenhancements1970 at gmail.com. Why, why don't you spell that creative enhancements okay. out? Because, you know... Everybody's not great uh, <laughs> spellers, and everybody didn't have a 3.7 GPA like you did, you know. So you have some folks, I mean, who are challenged. I'm just being honest, though. I felt so bad, too. Uh, it's C, as in paint, which I don't need. R-E-A-T-I-V-E-E-N-H-A-N-C-E-M-E-N-T-S. And 1970 at gmail.com. All right. All right. Sharon, is there any advice you'd like to give any females or males who will watch this video before I give my closing thoughts? Yes, there is. Um, and, and it's on both sides of the trajectory here. If it's someone that, that has been abused themselves, find someone that can trust and talk about it. It's, it's okay to get counsel. Yeah. And I think sometimes, especially our people, our, our culture, they think it's something wrong about being counseled, you know, being counseled. Now, I do preference a Christian counselor that's going to use the Bible <laughs> so that you can be really, you know, be delivered and set free. But, you know, if you just get a regular counselor, that's fine too. But still, go in there yourself and get some Bible scriptures out of there because there's a lot in the Bible 
that deals with suicide. There's a lot of things that deals in the Bible that deals with depression and all these different things. So get the Bible, first of all, and also get some counseling. And if it's the person that has been the offender, get some counseling. And also uh, turn him or her in yeah. to the police. Uh, who cares about them losing a job? Who cares about them losing a ministry? If they are violating you, turn them in to the law. And I want to say also this. I know mine was about sexual abuse, but abuse itself is unacceptable. Whether it's emotional, neglect, whether it's physical, all those forms of abuse are unacceptable. And I'm really passionate about when it's come dealing with children. Yeah. When a, when a parent is not providing and taking care of their children, especially young children, that's abuse. I concur. When they leave them in the homes to do things for themselves and they're seven and eight, nine years old, that's abuse. I agree. They have no business fixing their own food at six and seven years old. That's abuse. That's neglect. And we we sit back and say, well, man, my parent did. Whatever your parent did probably was wrong. We, we, we I never, I never go and say, say to my children or, you know, when they were growing up, I'm not trying to model what my parents did. I don't downplay what they did. They just did what they knew to do. So as I'm growing and becoming as a grandmother, I'm learning stuff that I didn't know as a mother. So I treat my grandchildren a little bit different because I've learned some things, especially being in Christ, that I didn't know when my boys were my grandchildren's age. So it's, it's, it's not okay to just leave them there and do this by themselves. It's not okay to do this and talk crazy to them and talk really negative and the reason why our children walk around so angry and emotionally disturbed is because what happens in the home goes everywhere with them. They're talked down on, they're they're not loved and appreciated, and enough people don't learn their own children's love languages to know what they need. They try to give them what they think they should want, have, because that's what they want, but their child may need a hug. I have a grandson, if I can say this really quick. One of my grandchildren is a hugger, and I'm not a hugger because at being being touched when I was young, I really don't like people on me like that. Yeah. Even those effects stay with you during life. Yeah. So they do. I'm not a big hugger, but I can hug when I'm doing ministry because they're more than on me to do that. But my grandson, my seven year old grandson, he is a hugger. So I have to hug him every day. That's his love language. And when I hug him, he just lights up like the Fourth of July fireworks. And then one of my other grandchildren. He is so he's, he's he doesn't like you know yelling at him. He's real sensitive to your voice levels, like my middle son was. So I had to learn this even about my my children that I can't give them all the same thing to make them feel loved. Yeah. And feeling love it goes a long way with all of us, whether we want to say it or not. Feeling just the feeling of love to a person goes a long way. You have to know uh, what works for one child may not work for the other child, but still exhibit love to both or all, all of the children. children. Uh, my thing is, most people have gone away and have never been teaching their children uh, the word of God. Train your mm -hmm. child in the way that he or she should go. When they get older, they will not depart. Doesn't mean they won't uh, go astray. They exactly. won't be like the prodigal son, but they know the path to return. Because a true sign of you truly being saved in the Lord is that you return like the part of the sun. But if you stay away, it's a sign that you would never say. All right, so let's give Arthur Sharon Fields a round of applause and thank her for coming on the Straight Butter Dating and Relationship Talk Show. Thank you, Sharon, for coming thank on the show. Me. This was a great experience. I'm glad you came. And so, hey, there's no need to be nervous. See, everything worked out. <laughs> Everything worked out. I feel like I had to put a lot of stuff in there so quickly. I think I well, missed something, but I didn't say it. It is. It is oh, what God. it is. My closing thoughts. I would ask everyone to share this powerful testimony from Sharon Fields of her transformation from being abused, broken, homeless, and suicidal to finding redemption in Christ Jesus. This inspiring story shares how one individual, Sharon Fields, found hope, healing, and purpose through her faith. If you or someone you know is struggling, know that there is always hope in Christ. Let this story be a reminder that no matter how dark life may seem, redemption is always possible. Don't let other people you know miss out on this touching testimony that will uplift someone's spirit and renew their faith. Thanks for watching this video. 
Don't forget to subscribe to Straight Butter Dating and Relationship Talk Channel for more relationship insight and advice based on the Bible scriptures and reasonable, sensible, and practical counsel. God bless you. Now that's straight butter.